Welcome everyone. We're glad that you're able to join us for the Capitol coup one year later, how research can assess and counter threats to democracy. This event is hosted by the Center for Information Technology and Public Life at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and the Institute for Data, Democracy and Politics at George Washington University. I'm understanding the growing impact of the internet, social media, and other forms of digital information in the context of people who design, use, and govern them. We're especially interested in people, platforms, and power. Our research takes a holistic approach to studying technology based on how social inequality and power structures shape the use, deployment, and impact of new technologies. We're committed to equality and justice in our scholarship. In that spirit, I'd like to take a moment to consider the legacy of colonization in our society. Our center occupies the essential language of the peoples and remains home today to the Okaniji. The university was funded in its early years from the sales of lands home to the Cherokee and Chickasaw nations. I invite you to join us in acknowledging our shared responsibility to pursue reconciliation. On this first anniversary of the attack on the U.S. Capitol, we recognize how that day continues to reverberate through our democracy. The vast implication for our political future. While journalists and public officials continue to investigate, academic researchers can also contribute to understanding, got to this point, what happened and why, and how to bring the democratic institutions. Yesterday, we explored how research can help make sense of January 6th. Today, as we discuss how researchers should respond to January 6th, our work should change in light of these events. We're lucky to have two excellent keynote presentations from Khadijah Costley White and Francesca. To introduce our first speaker, I'll turn the microphone over to my colleague, Dr. Daniel Priest, Edgar Thomas Cato Distinguished Professor at the School of Journalism and Media here at UPC and a principal researcher at the Daniel. Thanks, Katie. Um, it's my honor to Daniel, introduce- Daniel, audio is not coming through. Oh. No. I can hear it. Oh, it may just I, I also hear it. it. I also hear you, Daniel. <laughs> hear me. All right. Is this better? Good. Okay. It's my honor to introduce Khadija uh, Costley White. Dr. White is an associate professor in the Department of Journalism and Media Studies at Rutgers University in New Brunswick. White uh, is, was last year a Whitney uh, Public Engagement Fellow where she analyzed media coverage of school shootings and lockdown culture in New Jersey public schools. Dr. White is the author of more than a dozen peer-reviewed journal articles and book chapters analyzing media, identity, race, and culture, and was formerly a journalist on the Emmy-nominated news program and a New York City teaching fellow. Reflecting her commitment to public engagement, Dr. White has authored dozens of pieces and appeared in leading media outlets such as the BBC and NPR and the New York Times, and holds a PhD from the Annenberg School of Communication at the University of Pennsylvania. I wanna talk for one minute about Khadija's book, The Branding of Right-Wing Activism, The New Media and the Tea Party. When we talk about the need for interdisciplinary work to account for perspectives beyond our field, to truly incorporate a racial analysis into our understanding of politics, media, and power, I have Dr. White's book in mind. Branding of Right-Wing Activism is a book that should have penetrated our collective consciousness when it was published in 2018. It offers a guide to understanding the roots of January 6, 2021, and offered a very, very clear warning about what would culminate in the Trump presidency. White has been a decade ahead of most of us in clearly analyzing the threats to multiracial democracy that the Tea Party and modern conservatism poses. White centers her analysis on the ways that journalism, not just what is on offer from Fox News, but the institutional news media that we so often uncritically valorize, played a central role in constructing the Tea Party as a brand in ways that whitewashed its racism and its xenophobia portrayed it as falsely being leaderless and framed it as a populist uprising. As White writes, and I quote, in journalist descriptions of Tea Party class identities, explicit racism and xenophobia were marked 
as an expression of working class ignorance and anger instead of systematic and widespread ideologies. In the process, White shows us how the news media served as the Tea Party's promoters, fueled its growth, legitimated it, elevated its leaders, and helped further its extraordinary success as a social and electoral movement that blocked the Obama agenda and transformed Republican electoral politics, making it more extreme. Finally, White's book shows us how the Tea Party and journalism gave us new understandings of politics as a form of brand and media construction. And Dr. White shows us how the conservative movement learned to be the primary driver of American public discourse. These are the very forms of political engagement that both culminated in and were on full display at the US Capitol on January 6th, 2021. And with that, Khadija. Wow, uh, <laughs> Daniel, Dr. Kreis, thank you. Um, that was an incredible introduction. And I hope that I can illustrate some of what you're talking about today when I do this reflection. Um, so I'm just gonna open up my slides and um, and thank you again for, for that really um, glowing uh, recommendation of this. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna share my screen. And we'll kick off. Um, this was a really hard talk. I originally was like, sure, 20, 25 minutes, no problem. And then I started to kind of collect all of these items, especially this week as the reporting has peaked. So I probably won't get through everything, but I think that's fine. We'll talk more. Um, I also should warn everyone, I always try to, that um, there are toddlers or at least preschoolers in my house. Um, so uh, fingers crossed that we, we get to all just stay together, but I wanted to let you know in case you hear knocking on the door at any point. Um, so first I wanna thank the Institute for Data, Democracy and Politics at George Washington University and the Center for Inter Information Technology and Public Life um, at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill for inviting me um, and for working so hard to put this together uh, during a crazy time for all of us. Uh, we just got our first snowstorm up here in New Jersey. Um, I'm really glad to get the chance to talk to you all. This, this, this conversation I'm gonna try to have through these slides is mostly a reflection um, on my own research on the rise of the Tea Party in the news, uh, which I write about in my book that Daniel so um, kindly discussed, the branding of right-wing activism, uh, the news media in the Tea Party. Um, I'm gonna walk you through some of the key insights that kind of came out of that book. I'm not gonna go through everything, but I'm gonna say like, well, here's some things that I talk about in the book and here's some ways that I see it linking to the January 6th insurrection um, into Trumpism. And I'll try to close out with some kind of general discussions or thoughts, both about the implications for these insights in relation to journalism, um, but also in relation to us as scholars. And I also have tons of notes written for the Q&A. Uh, as I mentioned, I've been through the pandemic with toddlers uh, starting in 2020. So uh, my brain lives on paper, but uh, I'm really looking forward to going through that when we talk. Okay, so some of you might be asking you, why should you care about the rise of the Tea Party? Um, and uh, a, phen a conservative phenomenon that kicked off almost 13 years ago. Uh, how does that connect to now? Outside of the fact that some of the Tea Party folks like Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, um, Ted Cruz has been talking a lot lately, a lot those folks are at the very center of how we are talking about the insurrection. I'm also hoping that my reflection provides some context um, so that I answer that question by the end of this presentation. Uh, and um, I am going to start this presentation with that little picture at the very top that is um, from me at a shoot at the White House in 2010. I was a White House intern um, on the broadcast, the two-person broadcast media team at the Obama White House. And I was a media monitor during that time. I was constantly watching the news and writing it up for the White House. And I was watching the rise of the Tea Party and wondering why the hell it was getting so much news coverage because I couldn't understand what it was through the reporting. Um, and so during my time, uh, two, after that, two major things pulled me into this project. Um, so one was that there was a poll that showed that actually even though the news media was reporting on the Tea Party all the time, a majority, 55% of Americans had not even heard about the Tea Party and, um, and a significant portion said they had only heard some. Oh, sorry. Um, 
And two, I encountered a CBS poll in February 2010 that confirmed that my suspicions that the Tea Party movement was not some sort of working class revolt that was overtaking America, which was kind of a frame that I had informally observed in the media. Of those who did identify as a Tea Party supporter, one poll showed that they were older white Americans who were just as educated and made just as much money as the rest of the population. Um, and this kind of undermined the popular conception of the Tea Party as a working class movement. And of course, that's important for me to note here as we talk about January 6th, because it also mirrors the types of folks who have been arrested thus far in the January 6th insurrection. Um, Cynthia Miller Idris, who I just published, I think, a chapter with this past year, um, noted in the New York Times essay this week that a majority of the arrested folks in January 6th were employed, were teachers, chief executives, veterans, doctors, and lawyers. In my state, there's been a number of police officers and military reservists and um, business folks. Uh, so at least 20 in my own state of New Jersey. And so these are people who are employed, right? Um, there's a kind of constant notion that, you know, whenever people see this, this notion of trying to make them fringe, they start to talk about them as populists in terms of being economically disaffected. So it's really important to understand that that is a narrative that gets advanced here. Um, so for my work in the, on looking at the Tea Party, um, I decided to look at news stories about the Tea Party and political blogs, cable, print, and broadcast news. And so one of the things I always try to drive home is that I wasn't studying the Tea Party, right? Like I'm not an, I, I wouldn't even know if I'd say, I know quite a lot about the Tea Party, but I would say that I'm actually really interested in how the Tea Party comes to be um, in the media and what that means. And so the Tea Party gets kicked off at a very particular moment in time. Um, and I am keenly, keenly aware that some of you, you folks might have been in middle school or elementary school uh, since we're going back 13 years now. So it's a bit of history and I'll set the scene. Um, Barack Obama is the black democratic presidential nominee, the first one in, in the history of America. Um, and his primary challenge was really, the presidential primary is really fascinating and interesting because it involved the first potential um, woman president and Democratic nominee through Hillary Clinton, um, the first potential woman vice president, uh, well, second after Geraldine, on the Republican side, Sarah Palin, um, and an older white man, John McCain, in his 70s. So identity was actually really central to the campaign. And Mark, in my reading, one of the first times that reporters regularly and frequently discussed race and gender as especially important in regards to the identity of major presidential candidates, um, as there would be a historical first with the election of either candidate. And, and so what happens during that period is that reporters use Obama's racial identity as symbolic of American progress. Um, I'm not sure if you can read that the headline at the top. It says, when he gets elected the, um, in 2008, it says magical spell that will open new American era. And his race gets equated with novelty and progress as opposed to, you know, tradition and conservatism as represented in John McCain. Um, so on top of us having a magical new era, in America, apparently. Um, we also have a huge recession. The Great Recession is happening. The economy is falling apart. Tons of firms are failing. The government is trying to figure out. People are losing their homes because of these inflated mortgages. The Republican Party has a terrible, terrible brand, right, because they're supposed to be the leaders and they've led to this complete devastation of the economy. Democrats have taken back the Senate and the House. Um, all sorts of things over 40 years prior to that moment had changed and shifted the journalistic landscape. And then this moment happens in February, 2009. And apologies, it's an old video, so it's, it's but I think you should be able to hear it at least. Khadija, I don't think we can hear your audio on the video. Oh, okay, let me see. Sorry, everyone. I'm going to try to make sure that the audio is on here. Here we go. Okay, I'm going go. to start it over again. Here we go. 
No, the, the new administration's big on computers and technology. How about this, President and new administration? Why don't you put up a website to have people vote on the Internet as a referendum to see if we really want to subsidize the losers' mortgages, or would we like to at least buy cars and buy houses in foreclosure and give them to people that might have a chance to actually prosper down the road and reward people that could carry the water instead of drink the water. Hey, Rick, That's did, a novel idea. Hey, hey Rick, did you... What? Who oh, that? Yeah, yeah, they, they're, 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 like putting, they're like putty in your hands. Did you hear? No, they're not, Joe. They're not like putty in our hands. This is America. How many of you people want to pay for your neighbor's mortgage that has an extra bathroom and can't pay their bills? Raise their hand. How about we all... <laughs> President Obama, are you listening? I mean, How about we all stop paying our mortgage? It's a moral hazard. <laughs> this is like mob rule here. I'm getting scared. I'm glad I'm, I'm glad I'm a... Don't get scared, Jackson. Jason. Okay, you get people fired Jason, you, you, you want to... We're thinking of having a Chicago tea party in July. All you capitalists that want to show up to Lake Michigan, I'm going to start organizing. Why are you jumping in... Okay, so so this is the moment that um, is kind of widely acknowledged as the moment that the Tea Party gets kicked off. It's by a reporter that is Rick Santelli on CNBC um, while he is reporting live, uh, and he is still a reporter on CNBC. Um, and I think that for me, this is a really important moment in really understanding how the journalism, journalism, how journalists and the Tea Party were really linked from the very beginning. And there are a few key arguments that my book makes about this moment with Santelli and what it tells us about media and politics now um, and what it tells us about a journalist being credited as a founder of the movement, of the Tea Party movement. Um, cause be, so one of the things you should know is that even though this was a major departure from traditional news values for reporting, such as objectivity and nonpartisanship, Santelli's rant was largely marked as a success and not a journalistic failure. Um, New York Times kind of bemoaned that nobody at the network um, had been concerned about him exceeding the bounds of news reporting. The clip was not only circulated by major conservative blogs and news aggregators, um, CNBC posted the video on the company website. It received 1.7 million views um, and it became the highest viewed online clip ever at that time. Uh, it even received an official response from the um, press, press secretary, um, of the White House, Robert Gibbs, and there was no seeming fallout. In fact, Santelli got a lot of credit. And even though he didn't um, get sent to cover the first major tax day Tea Party protest in April later on that year, a couple months after the speech, he said he was, quote, pretty proud of this, right? And so this, this moment kicks off some observations on news reporting in the Tea Party, its brand, and I think also um, you'll see how it connects to January 6th, or at least how you see these patterns still occurring at this moment. Um, and so here are some of the key patterns I'm going to at least mention for today. The importance of branding and brand culture, the mainstreaming of whiteness and white supremacy, um, the news as a citizen activist, and the circulation of conservative misinformation and brands. I argue in my book that while there were indeed grassroots supporters of the Tea Party, um, it's best understood as a multifaceted discursive signifier that helps attract voters. It got media attention, it helped reinvent the Republican Party and reinvigorate it. Um, and in other words, it mostly functioned as a brand. And people often ask me, well, what is a brand? Uh, and so by branding, um, I mean, I'm drawing on the work of scholars like Naomi Klein, who define brand as an identity, an essence, or a corporate consciousness. Um, it's not about the products, but about what those products mean to people's lives. Um, uh, and other scholars, Sarah Benet Weiser there. Um, in the marketing of politics, a brand is a message or story that builds lasting relationships with the target audience. It creates emotional connections to policies or candidates that often outweigh material consequences or even allow people to work against their own interests. Um, it's a cognitive shortcut that really helps people understand a specific product and helps you differentiate it from other things, right? So it's just one of those things you hear it and you can recognize it instantly. That's part of the, the function of a brand um, and that you have emotions that are attached to it immediately. And, uh, and it allows us to understand voters as citizen consumers. So scholars have argued over the last 40 years that communication between politicians and voters have transitioned into less face-to-face -face contact where, you know, candidates used to 
uh, elected officials used to meet with people face to face, um, and a much heavier reliance on broadcasted media mediated images to voters. The rise of branding and political communication has meant a switch in news media's focus from substantive political issues and policies to an emphasis on image, personality, and emotions, um, especially in reporting on political phenomena like the Tea Party. So actually one study of a news coverage found that people received more information about political candidates from paid political ads than they did even from news coverage um, because the news instead focused significantly more on campaign strategy and polling data than on policy. Uh, and this is important, right? Because if we're reporting from brand in a brand culture, um, okay. I just saw a chat, so I want to make sure. Um, if we're reporting on policy in a brand culture, we have to understand how that changes our understanding of um, reporting in a democracy. In a democracy, the rules and practices of government should mostly benefit the public. That is, building and developing policies for the public is really key to a functioning democracy. And in that framework, relaying information that helps the public better understand policy is a vital function that journalists serve. Um, that's why we call them the fourth estate, so that people can communicate and react to the actions of the leaders, of our leaders, and to hold them accountable. But in a brand culture, um, if journalists are reporting on a brand culture and that's their focus, not democracy, the media tends to focus on how a politician makes them feel not not the impact of their policies. One's identity connects to politics and reinforces those, feel, those feelings. Um, people in a brand culture are expected to vote their taste and not necessarily for specific uh, political outcomes. That is, politics is, a cons is consumption in brand culture and citizenship becomes a lifestyle that emphasizes individualism and self-fulfillment. Politics in a brand culture is a form of self-expression and identity rather than a tool of power and governance. In this way, a political brand culture often stands in conflict with the goals of democracy, which should theoretically aim for a mutually beneficial society focused on best serving public interests. Um, and so key to, key to all of this is that, um, that brands are not just labels or identifiers, they're identities rooted in social relationships, race, gender, and class can become really important in narratives in a brand culture because it helps humanize political brands and it increases their emotional appeal um, to consumers, to citizen consumers. And so when I looked at the Tea Party, there was frequently ways that the, that the news media used, um, used class, race, and gender to, um, class, race, and gender to talk about populism. Um, and uh, one of those examples uh, was Mama Grizzly. So Sarah Palin, I thought, was kind of the expert actually here. She she really, I think, is a figure for me that best represents you know, how Trump was able to create his brand. Um, she, while she was you know, after her run, she creates these Mama Grizzly, this Mama Grizzly pack. Um, it's an cognitive shortcut for referencing conservative women candidates at the time that she supported. Um, Mama Grizzlies as a term invokes the idea of women, specifically white women, right, fighting for their children and the political background the way that mama bear, that a mama bear would naturally and violently fight for the safety of her own cubs. I, I, her own cubs. So I, I think of this as a really brilliant um, move. Ironically, a substantial number of Sarah Palin's Mama Grizzly candidates were not actually mothers at all. Um, they didn't have kids, but it was a really effective branding term that helped extend the Tea Party's revolutionary populist brand, um, but allowed it to uh, evoke feelings related to motherhood. It softened the anger and rage as self-defense. It justified um, as maternal instinct any of their potential harsh political attacks or physical attacks as we've seen on January 6th. And Mama Grizzly connects really easily to people, right? It's an image and it's a term that can kind of create a very easy brand. Um, and so in branding, race and gender helps make a brand seem more human, amplifies its emotional connections to consumers. And I, um, I want you to keep this all in mind as you watch this clip from yesterday, CBS reporting on January 6th. What was it like in Washington on January 6th? Well, it's a little chilly out here, but it was freezing there. As people stormed the Capitol one year ago today, Sharon Story and her husband Victor did not follow the crowd inside. People started singing the national anthem. And it came all across all of us. And 
everybody, once they started hearing it, was participating. And it was just exciting. But this grandmother of 10, who had driven all the way from Gaffney, South Carolina, to be there, firmly believes that the American democracy she used to teach about in her sixth grade classroom is on the edge of collapse. Do you think a civil war is possible in your lifetime? I think if they push people too far against the wall, especially the Southerners, they're not going to take it. And that feeling of fraud, if only a feeling, is what led so many to Washington on January 6th to, in their minds, defend democracy. The words that come to mind for you to describe the feeling and the atmosphere there, what are they? Patriotic, unity, hope. When you hear other people describe it as a riot or an insurrection, mm -mm. how do you feel? I feel upset. Her belief that... Okay, so emotions, feelings, um, they go on in this piece. You should check it out if you if you get a chance. I can drop the, the link. Oh, uh, not everybody has access to that, but um, it was on CBS and it should be still featured. CBS Mornings yesterday. Um, they go on to juxtapose her with a Black woman bartender from Brooklyn who supports Bernie Sanders and who supported Bernie Sanders in the 2016 primaries. Um, they don't mention whether or not she has family in any way. Um, and she also, I will note, did not attack the Capitol and was not a group, was not with a group who attacked the U.S. Capitol, but that is who they juxtaposed her with in that piece yesterday. Um, and that connects to the mainstreaming of white supremacy and whiteness that happens through these stories, right? Um, so what ends up happening is you keep kind of relaying these narratives that soften white political rage, um, and you get a very different reading of the Tea Partiers at their protest on the left, or you know, Black Panthers historically on the right, um, or again, the insurrectionists on the left, um, and the peaceful protests of George Floyd's murder by police on the right, right? These these get read differently in the press. Uh, so this is a blind spot for white terrorism and white violence. Um, and it links to the government's, this is not just a problem in the journal, journalism, of course, because it links to the government's seeming inability to investigate and even thwart these threats in everyday life. Um, as Miller just pointed out in that Times essay I mentioned earlier, the U.S. has foiled, has quote, foiled only 21 of the 110 known domestic terrorist attacks and plots in 2020. Um, and so there's a failure that permeates our kind of larger um, ideology for society that comes through these narratives that downplay this type of violence. Um, and I want you to kind of keep thinking about that uh, clip as you watch this exchange between, um, so that was on CBS and watch this exchange between Tucker Carlson and Ted Cruz last night. Because the way I phrased things yesterday, it, it was sloppy and, and it was frankly dumb. And, I don't and buy that. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold, I don't hold, buy that. Look, I've known you a long time since before you went to the Senate. You were a Supreme Court contender. You take words as seriously as any man who's ever served in the Senate. And every word you repeated that phrase. I do not believe that you use that accidentally. I just don't. It's, so, Tucker, as a result of my sloppy phrasing, it's caused a lot of people to misunderstand what I meant. Let me tell you what, what I meant to say. What I was referring to are, are the limited number of people who engaged in violent attacks against police officers. Now, I think you and I both agree that if you assault a police officer, you should go to jail. That's who I was talking about. And the reason the phrasing was sloppy is I have talked dozens, if not hundreds of times, I've drawn a distinction. I wasn't saying that the thousands of peaceful protesters supporting Donald Trump are somehow terrorists. I wasn't saying the millions of, of, of patriots across the country supporting President Trump are terrorists. And that's what a lot of people have misunderstood well, that. Well, wait a I second, but even your yeah. way, but hold on. What you just said doesn't make sense. So if somebody assaults a cop, he should be charged and go to jail. I couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. We have said that for years, but that person's still not a terrorist. How many people have been charged with terrorism? Okay. So, um, and so this, this framing from Fox, uh, I think you can kind of clearly link that to also some of the echoing, the echoes of that CBS clip I just showed. Um, I'm gonna, and I'm looking at the time, and of course, as always, I put too much here. So I'm just gonna try to try to close this with a few 
different things. Um, one of the issues here is that the, the news becomes um, a citizen activist through the rise of the Tea Party. And I think that's part of what we're seeing reverberate now. Um, the Tea Party, the news media helped provoke um, the Fox News and specifically helped provoke news coverage. So if you look on the right, that's a, um, a Washington Post. There was a full page ad that they took out in the Washington Post asking why other networks weren't covering the Tea Party. And so they start to provoke coverage. CNN responds. They um, ultimately respond by justifying their coverage, saying that they're covering the Tea Party. Um, and that, and then they ultimately even broadcast the first, for the broadcast this um, Tea Party State of the Union address in 2011, and they become the first major television network to ever air a third party's rebuttal to the president's annual speech. Um, and Rachel Maddow at the time calls it a remarkable act of journalistic intervention to elevate a group in which they're co-sponsoring a presidential debate to the level of the major parties in the country. But this, this provocation works. Um, Fox is also advertising Tea Party rallies. They're appearing at them. Um, they're posting this on their uh, page when they're reporting. They're headlining Tea Parties, um, and they're they're giving constant advice to how it should develop. Um, and so I argue in the book that Fox News functions more like a political party than Tea Party ever did um, through all of these events, mobilizing people, creating a specific policy agenda. And we see that even in the, the January 6th um, rally. So Sean Hannity's um, text to Donald Trump during, or to Mark Meadows during the insurrection last year, um, that one on the right, these are, Laura Ingraham is the top left one. Sean Hannity is saying, can he make a statement asking people to leave the Capitol? They're doing advice. Um, Adam Schiff here, there's an exchange between Adam Schiff and Chris Hayes where Chris Hayes says, well, how are you going to bring him in? Um, isn't this a, isn't there a question about the First Amendment? I'm not going to play it. Um, there's a first, there's a question about journalists and being able to be reporters. And so that is the problem here, right? Um, Fox News gets to kind of claim journalistic credibility when they want to, and people pick up their stories, but they also are constantly acknowledged as propagandists um, or people who are, or, or a network or an outlet that serves to fun to relay and convey misinformation. Um, and we see that through <laughs> the Tea Party um, when they attack a Black woman USDA uh, official named Charlotte Sherrod. Um, Breitbart releases a fake video. It ends up getting her fired by the Obama administration later on. Um, you find out that it was a lie. And we see those brands, and we see that this continues to happen even today, that people are taking up these types of brands that get produced out of places like Fox News through the anti-CRT, the anti-critical race theory, or really, right, the anti-education around race and theory and um, racism and the history of racism in America. And we see that movement happening right now. This is the guy who um, claimed, who is known as being the start, where he's talking about the brand of critical race theory. Um, Donald Trump represents a huge brand, and I often say that scholars should think about him as a brand rather than as a political official um, because of, of the way in which he aims to attract and appeal to his base as fans and as consumers um, and not as an electorate, right? Uh, so, I'm, there are a lot of implications for that. And I guess we can discuss that more during um, during the uh, during the discussion. Um, but I, I guess I'll end with saying that um, besides sorry besides these implications, the displacing activism, rebranding citizenship, race as an empty signifier through all of this. Um, the need for there's a need for new journalistic standards. Um, I really think that Trump showed us that if you have a politician who holds a high office who's committed to misinformation and disinformation, we need to really study state. We really need to establish standards that allow people to be deplatformed, not just on Twitter, but in journalism. Um, who gets to be interviewed? Who gets to speak to the American public? You can't just allow them to provide platforms for lies. Uh, and I also think as scholars, we need to think about the whiteness of our own field. Um, we need to think about the ways that we actively engage in, and convey this material to other people. And, uh, and I think Daniel Kreese and other scholars really did an excellent job with that last year at the close of the election um, when we were trying to figure out how to mobilize information and to um, respond to journalists who were reporting on it. And, um, and I think that's it. Uh, thank you so much for listening, and thank you for allowing me to talk to you. 
Thank you so very much, Dr. White. I really appreciate you sharing your work and your expertise with us this morning. Uh, I think we so often overlook the role of media in building and shaping political movements directly. Um, for those of you who've been listening, if you'd like to learn more, uh, Dr. White's book is called The Branding of Right-Wing Activism, The News Media and the Tea Party, and examines the ways that partisan and nonpartisan online broadcast and print news constructed the Tea Party. So here's our next speaker. I'd like to welcome Dr. Siva Vadyanathan, Robertson Professor of Media Studies and Director of the Center for Media and Citizenship at the University of Virginia. Siva, over to you. Thank you, Catherine. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Francesca Tripodi, uh, who is our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Tripodi is a sociologist and media scholar. Her research examines the relationship among social media, political partisanship, and democratic participation. She's done particularly interesting work on how Google and Wikipedia are manipulated by certain actors and groups for political gain. Dr. Tripodi is an assistant professor at the University of North Carolina School of Information and Library Science. She's also a senior faculty researcher with the Center for Information Technology and Public Life at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And she's an affiliate at the Data and Society Research Institute. She is a former graduate student of the University of Virginia where she worked closely with me, one of the best experiences I have had in my career. Uh, she earned both her MA and her PhD in sociology from the University of Virginia. Uh, before that, she had earned an MA in Communication, Culture, and Technology from Georgetown University. Now, since uh, Dr. Tripodi has uh, entered the public light exploring these issues, she's done so with tremendous courage, uh, tremendous clarity, and tremendous effect. In 2019, Dr. Tripodi testified before the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee about her research in which she explained how search processes are gamed to maximize exposure and drive ideologically based queries. Now this research is the basis of her book, which is under contract with Yale University Press. And I think there are many people, including myself, who can't wait to read and assign this book. Dr. Tripodi also studies patterns of gender inequality on Wikipedia, shedding light on how knowledge is contested in the 21st century. I might add that in many ways, Dr. Tripodi is a model scholar, someone who reaches beyond disciplines while being deeply grounded in her own discipline, someone who has mastered the techniques of ethnography and is conversant in the techniques of data science. Uh, the subject matter she studies is of course crucial to our moment, but also her style of presentation in the classroom, to the public and to scholarly groups is certainly an ideal form and one we should all try to emulate. So now, Dr. Francesca Tripodi. Thank you so much, Siva, for that really wonderful introduction. It is quite an honor to be with everyone here today. And to speak alongside Dr. White has really been um, just a tremendous experience. Much of what I'm going to talk about today is based on my forthcoming book called The Propagandist's Playbook. This book combines ethnographic observations of college Republican group and a women's Republican group, alongside media immersion of the right-wing media ecosystem, content analysis, and metadata from YouTube. And it provides de a detailed analysis of the seven tactics conservative elites use to spread disinformation in pursuit of partisan political goals. The book begins with my ethnographic observations of the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, and it ends with content analysis of conservative media coverage of the Capitol coup. Today, I'm going to start at the end and work my way back to demonstrate that the narratives used to both inspire action and deny culpability around what happened a year ago date long, long, long before then. Through data triangulation, I peel back the layers of the conservative media manipulation machine and reveal why and how conservative elites are so effective at exploiting their constituents' worldviews and media practices. What my research demonstrates is how political actors routinely wield disinformation to strengthen their hold on power and deny culpability for their involvement in political violence. 
A year ago, we bore witness to what can happen when political leaders deny free and fair elections and encourage their supporters to do their own research on what they know is not true. We saw what happens when lies become a reality. That day began with a speech from then President of the United States, Donald Trump. Standing on the ellipse just south of the White House, he addressed thousands gathered to protest what they believe to be a stolen election. Turn your cameras, please, he said to the news media covering the event, and show what's really happening out here, because these people are not going to take it any longer. In his speech, he credited his supporters for inventing the phrase, stop the steal, but it was hardly the creation of 2020 MAGA Nation. The word stop the steal first appeared back in 2016 when Trump supporters thought that the Clintons were attempting to steal the presidential election. As you can see from Google Trends data, it became the search term du jour in the weeks leading up to the 2016 election, resurfaced again just before the 2018 midterms, before it peaked in 2020. 2016 Twitter posts using the Stop the Steal hashtag strung together a set of lies that resurfaced again and again during my research on conservative information ecosystems. Some centered around anti-Semitism, that George Soros, a Jewish billionaire and humanitarian, had paid to rig the 2016 election. While others just relied on other kinds of racism, like illegal aliens threaten democracy. Some foreshadowed conservative pundits' obsession with Dominion voting. These posts insinuated that voting machines were generally unreliable. And one Trump even included an advertisement for a company titled Trump Ballot Security with the email stopthesteal at gmail.com. Roger Stone, a conservative political con consultant and lobbyist, openly supported the Stop the Steal movement in 2016 and encouraged groups in contested areas to talk with voters as they left the polls, supporting Trump's concept of poll watchers. For over four years, Stop the Steal had been gaining momentum and Trump used that to his advantage, encouraging those there on January 6th to walk down to the Capitol. And after this, we're going to walk down and I'll be there with you, he promised. We are going to walk down to the Capitol because you'll never take back our country with weakness. We've amassed overwhelming evidence about a fake election. He went on to fill the ears of his supporters with unsubstantiated claims of fraud, including that dead people had voted, that non-citizens, felons, and people who had moved voted, that tens of thousands of votes were switched from Trump to Biden, that Dominion voting machines had a 93.67% error rate, that secret operatives were stuffing thousands of unsecure ballots into duffel bags on park benches, that mail-in ballots were backdated so they could still count. At one point during his speech, Trump asserted that the presidential election of 2020 was, and I quote, the most corrupt election in the history, maybe of the world. Framing those who stood before him as patriots, Trump proclaimed that our brightest days are before us our greatest achievements still away, before encouraging his supporters to fight like hell, because if they didn't, they wouldn't have a country anymore. The people there that day listened to his call for action. They walked in mass down Pennsylvania Avenue to take back their country. In the end, Trump did not join the protesters on their journey. Instead, he live tweeted, under the protection of the Secret Service, as people breached police lines and began scaling the walls, he called his vice president a coward on Twitter and reasserted election fraud. As Capitol Police officers shot a Trump supporter, he released a pre-taped response from the White House lawn, encouraging those there to go home, but still claiming the election was stolen. 
Despite Trump's clear motivational stance and video showing hundreds of Trump supporters ransacking the Capitol, the right-wing information ecosystem quickly tried to frame the insurrectionists as anti-Trumpers and spread lies that Antifa were the ones behind the violence. Candace Owens tweeted that Antifa thugs were probably in the mix. Todd Herman began his episode of Rush Limbaugh's podcast by claiming he had been monitoring Antifa chat channels and knew firsthand that Antifa had embedded themselves among the protesters and were the ones causing the problems. On Fox News that night, Laura Ingram repeated the same allegations, stating that there were some reports that Antifa sympathizers may have been sprinkled through the crowd. On One American News, they described the, anti the, the chaos as Antifa-like tactics. And when interviewed about what happened on January 6th, conservative elites applied the same tactics of misdirection. Speaking on Lou Dobbs, Representative Mo Brooks said that there were two parts to this event and that there were indications that Antifa had embedded themselves in the Trump rally. The Washington Times ran an article titled, Facial Recognition Identifies Extremists Storming the Capitol. But in the article, the reporter claimed those who were the extremists were Antifa. The next morning, Representative Matt Gates took to the House floor and used the article as evidence to claim that some group anti Paul Gosser shared the story on Twitter. And even though the claims have been dis disputed and that Twitter account was suspended, this tweet is still up. Even though the Washington Times issued a correction, the misinformation is still widely accessible with a simple Google search. When you look up Washington evidence, the top return is still the article. And the summary underneath reads, Trump supporters say that Antifa members disguised as one of them infiltrated the protesters who stormed the US Capitol on Wednesday. Although the FBI found no evidence to back these claims, disinformation surrounding the insurrection persists. According to an April 2021 poll, more than one fifth of Republican voters blame Antifa for the violence at the Capitol. As of June 2021, 33% of Americans defined the events of January 6th as legitimate protest. As of October of last year, 66% of Republicans do not view the storming of the U.S. Capitol as an attack on the government, and over 75% do not hold Trump responsible. When the House Homeland Security Committee tried to create a bipartisan commission to investigate the attack, any investigation in the lead up to 26, excuse me, to January 6th must also include an examination of the violence from far left groups like Antifa. But it would be amiss to think that these opinions were somehow formed in isolation, rare distortions of reality. Time and again, conservative elites encourage their supporters to see both sides of domestic terrorism. In doing so, they equate civil rights protesters with white supremacists and portray insurrectionists as patriots. These tired narratives have been recycled for centuries. That progressives threaten freedom or that unanticipated election results are somehow illegitimate. Take Trump's mantra that his, reporter, his supporters stop the steal. A nearly identical claim can be traced all the way back to the 1870s when Black Americans used their voting rights to elect Black men to serve in the U.S. Congress following the passage of the Reconstruction Act. Shortly after lies circulated that African Americans had abused their voting privileges, engaged in corruption, and stood generally unfit for democracy. The language used by Trump to secure election observers is also a reused effort to suppress minority vote Back in 1981, 
the Republican National Committee created the National Ballot Security Task Force, a group of armed, off-duty police officers hired to patrol polling sites in traditionally Black and Hispanic neighborhoods. The falsehood that others steal their elections is then used to justify their own efforts to rig electoral outcomes. Take the recent legislation in Georgia titled the Election Integrity Act that restricts access to the polls or the redistricting maps here in North Carolina, otherwise known as gerrymandering. These same threats to patriotism, calls for protectionism, and scapegoating the left were intimately woven into the white supremacist events that terrorized Charlottesville, Virginia during the summer of 2017. Many people don't realize it, but August 12th was the third time that summer white supremacists had actively organized a rally in the town. On May 13th, UVA alumni Richard Spencer organized a rally claiming that removing the Confederate statues in town was censorship. Storming through the park in black boots and wielding a bullhorn, he was joined by women in floor length linen dresses and men in button down shirts and khakis. They shouted, you will not replace us. And later that night carried tiki lit torches through town shout chanting, Russia is our friend and blood and soil, a refrain of the Nazi slogan ref referencing a racially ideal body. Here's a clip of this gathering that I captured on May 13th. On, on July 8th, oh, excuse me. On July 8th, the Ku Klux Klan came to town. Waving Confederate flags, they tried to equate the removal of Confederate statues as cult genocide. And on August 11th and 12th, I saw white supremacists scope out their parking prospects and organize rendezvous points. I saw firsthand as hundreds of white nationalists stormed the public squares and the National Guard took over Main Street. But before they arrived, they used Facebook to gauge how many attendees would be there, promote their all-star lineup of white supremacists. And Jason Kessler held a live Q&A session on Twitter so that people could coordinate ride sharing and finance GoFundMe campaigns. On this Facebook group, they also use stand your ground language, claiming that Antifa would pose a threat to those coming that day. And as the rally was unfolding, people were already trying to deflect the blame away from the white supremacist groups. Shortly after James Fields ran his car into a crowd of counter protesters, HN posters were trying to claim that it was anti Trump leftists there and using it to call it an Antifa rally in Virginia. The right-wing media ecosystem quickly followed suit. Infowars published an article titled, Bombshell Connection Between Charlottesville, Soros, and the CIA, claiming that George Soros had paid Antifa protesters to attend the rally and make Trump look bad. In the weeks and months that followed, numerous other articles came out equating Black Lives Matter with Antifa and framing them as the villains in white supremacist rallies, as the instigators of violence. Many people remember Trump claiming that there were very fine people on both sides, but Trump also asserted that there was blame on both sides. This purposeful misdirection and use of the phrase outsiders, it echoes language used by segregation, segregationists who described civil rights protesters as communist agitators and is reminiscent of Nixon's 1960s campaign speech where he blamed racial conflict on extremists of both races. Those I interviewed as part of my study believed what their news media and political representatives were telling them. One man in his 60s 
told me just a few days after August 12th that what I had witnessed firsthand had been staged. One of the strategies is to create chaos, he said. Soros and similar groups, these people show up from out of town and I don't know, it adds to the fakeness of the whole thing, he said. College students I spoke with also agreed with Trump's assessment that both sides could be blamed for the violence. When I asked who these sides were, they were explicit. Even though they thought white supremacists were a horrible group, they also thought Antifa was wrong because they had incited violence. One woman I spoke with that day described the torchlit march as just a little rally. But I think this quote from a member of the women's group I observed really sums it up best. Black Lives Matter and Ava, whatever, they are known to be agitators. They are known for burning down these cities. And I tell you what, as an American citizen, I'm really sick of this crap. Taken collectively, the statements of conservative media personalities, the president, and my respondents imply a few things. First, they create a narrative whereby those who showed up to protect Confederate heritage were the good guys and therefore different from the real white supremacists. Second, these quotes demonstrate how disinformation ebbs and flows along a predictable path, dating back decades. And third, these stories create a unified villain that the left, referred to by many names like Black Lives Matter, Antifa, social justice warriors, or its newest iteration, critical race theory, is somehow dangerous, is a cornerstone of the propaganda that conservative elites regularly feed their audiences. But these political tactics hold legal ramifications. It's how the founding fathers denied Native Americans citizenship so that they could not participate in the elections. It's what allowed the FBI to classify Martin Luther King as a communist threat and monitor him without warrant. It's why James Field's attorney felt justified in claiming that a person driving their car into a crowd was operating under self-defense. It's how Kyle Rittenhouse was acquitted of murder. And it's how conservative politicians and pundits can frame insurrectionists as patriots, protectors of the evil left who supposedly stole an election. As my research demonstrates, media manipulators have a remarkable understanding of how misinformation is connected to worldviews. They routinely and effectively curate, optimize, and monetize unique phrases to amplify and organize social movements that impact political outcomes. And this is perhaps the most dangerous part of this loop. What is often promoted as an avenue for self-discovery is more like participating in a scavenger hunt engineered by those spreading the lies. They suggest audiences go out to search for the truth on their own, but only after seeding the internet with problematic content and tagging information with phrases designed to keep viewers following the well-worn pathways within conservative ideology. It's how Representative Devin Nunez tried to misdirect the public during President Trump's first impeachment hearing, encouraging those watching to pay more attention to things like Nellie Orr and Fusion GPS than Trump's political wrongdoings or the way Roger Stone created the catchphrase collusion delusion. And it's how they get enough constituents questioning the integrity of the election that Google begins to autocomplete stop the with steel, directing searchers to a rally nearest to their location. Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene described how she engaged in this IKEA effect of misinformation when she testified before Congress as the House debated whether or not to remove her from her two committees. She explained that her distrust of mainstream media combined with a quest for truth led her straight to QAnon. 
as researchers, journalists, policy major makers, legislators, and technological innovators, we must push back on this continued effort to mainstream extremism. To do so, we can start analyzing events like January 6th as part of a larger contextual pattern built on a historical legacy of lies. By offering a more nuanced understanding of the key words and processes that conservative pundits and politicians rely on to amplify, validate, and normalize white supremacist, we can then work together to try and create practical guides to break the disinformation feedback loop. Most efforts are still retroactively targeting misinformation and its impact on society. But to treat information disorder proactively, we need more research on how individuals and communities use, understand, and trust information, but also how those systems are exploited. Because disinformation is not a bug in the code. It's a feature wielded for political gain and a great risk to American democracy. Thank you for your time. Dr. Chapoti, Francesca, thank you. Um, it's always a pleasure to get to hear about your work. I've been lucky to hear you talk about these topics many times and I still learn something new each one. For those of you interested in learning more, um, please keep an eye out for her upcoming the Propagandist Playbook, which provides a detailed analysis of seven tactics conservative elites use to exploit media literacy practices and spread disinformation in pursuit of partisan political goals. Thank you again for joining us as our audience this morning. Um, if you'd like to keep in touch with CTAP, IDDP, or our work, you can find us on Twitter at UNC underscore CTAP or at GWIDDP or online at CTAP.UNC.edu and iddp.gwu.edu. If you're part of our public audience today, this is the end of the open portion of this conference. We really appreciate you taking part. If you're one of our research colleagues joining us for the closed afternoon panels, those will begin on Zoom in approximately two minutes. If you run into any technical issues joining, you can reach out to us at ctap at unc.edu for technical assistance. Um, thank you again to our speakers, to our presenters, and to our audience.